Hoss truck and they're going to take the forklifts and put as much in that truck as we can get in there and then I'll take my truck and maybe a trailer and see if we can get some in there. But I had forgotten about the masks and we had those Sunday and I forgot to mention them. Those boxes are right back here under this table in the hallway. You can take all that you want, give them away, use them, whatever. And they said they have tons of these left. I'm trying to find out who needs them or who would want them. I don't know about the quality. That's why I asked Barbara. Well, she's in the hospital here every day. She's sick a lot, so she's there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she would know. You said they're pretty good. Um, okay, you check it out. Let me know. <laughs> That's right. It's not. It's kind of It could be the other thing y'all mentioned. So oh, Facebook is running, so I'll repeat you there. Okay, that's good. So if you're interested, let me know. If you know someone that's interested, or if you can give them away. The MREs went really quickly. I don't know if there's a box or two left out there, but we went through a pallet very quickly. So... Um, we'll get as much as we can tomorrow. Military ready to eat. Meal ready. Meal ready to eat. Meals ready to eat. My my ex husband loves them. I'd like to put it as a reflection on my cookie. <laughs> 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 so y'all had to eat them before. Chandra's had them. Ken's had them. Oh yes, you're not picky if you're hungry. You can get one or two before you. You used to get cigarettes with them. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. I sure did. I heard that. <laughs> well, those are the two things that are available now, and that's one thing that I miss about Spokes of Hope because. We were getting so much from them at one time, all the, the hand sanitizer and the wipes, and they had toiletries and care packages and stuff, and they shut down, at least temporarily. I, I checked weeks ago about getting more hand sanitizer, and I couldn't. Uh, so I don't know what's going on there, but um, the thing with Spokes of Hope is that they were a, a hub, and people would ship things to them from all over the country. They didn't have to go solicit. It would come to them in truckloads. I mean truckloads. Like when we were doing the hand sanitizer, at one time they had 18 truckloads coming in. Of hand sanitizer, wipes, alcohol, the different sizes, the sunscreen, the, the spray sunscreen. We had so much stuff. And we took it to restaurants. I was telling Chandra just a moment ago, we took it to restaurants, to the schools, and we delivered so much stuff. So anyway, if, if y'all can use the MREs and the masks, let me know. We're going tomorrow. So if, if it can be used, we'll bring as much as possible, and we'll sit it out there at the picnic shelter. I don't want to start stockpiling in the building here, but we can put it out there and hopefully uh, distribute it as quickly as possible. What, what, uh, um, Brandon said he'd be freed up around lunchtime. So I don't know exactly what time, but around lunch, we're supposed to head down to the, uh, we actually go through Market Common uh, toward the back side of the, what used to be the back side of the air base. I think it's the same entrance that you went to if you went to the air show. Uh, you came down the dead ends there at the back of the Air Force Base or the airport now. But if you're interested, let me know if you want to go. Um, that'd be great. So, all right. I'm not going to ask y'all if y'all been behaving because I know better. <laughs> 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 well, I have all the faith in the world that you've been misbehaving. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Can I share something I already shared with these ladies? So sure. Real quick. Go right ahead, Marjorie. If we are not hungry for Christ, we are probably too full of ourselves. Oh. And I like that. Too. Uh, that's true. <laughs> Very true. Um. I wouldn't know personally, but I might send you something. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I'm sorry to be... <laughs> I'm sorry to be checking my phone, but I was trying to find out if Garnett's still having her surgery tomorrow. 
And I think, uh, as far as we as know, far as she Sunday, is. Yeah. Garnett's having foot surgery tomorrow, as far as we know. If you hear anything different there, let us know. But let's pray for Garnett, Bird. Also on our prayer list, um, put James and Jennifer Hurl on there. And uh, continue to pray for them. Also, Penny Tolls. Penny Tolls. She's in room 262 at the hospital right now. Um, Penny um, is friends with several folks here, and she's uh, don't know exactly what's going on, but there's a thing on her foot, and she's um, struggling with something there. Yeah, she was here Sunday. Is this Penny? No. No, no, no. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Not, this not is that. a friend of Mary Keenan's? Yes, this yeah. is a friend of Mary Keenan's. Okay. Uh, Penny Tolls. Daughter used to be married to Miss Wiley's son, so that's how that connection is. And she lives in the apartments where my mom's name is on the list there behind Marty's. Um, but um, no, not that penny. Um, that's different. Joel and Penny. Um, sorry, different penny. But this penny is a diabetic, and I think the thing on her foot is somehow related there. We don't know the details, but please put penny tolls on your list. <laughs> Also, Laura Maruska, she did go to the doctor this past Monday. Um, they're still trying some different things on her knee. They're talking about a different kind of brace, and they tried to draw fluid but couldn't get any. Said that it may be in pockets, but her knee is still swelling. It still has infection. So they have already told her that, worst case scenario, she would lose the leg. So they're trying their best to make sure that doesn't happen. But... Um, She's, she needs some prayer. She's dealing with a lot there, so please pray for Laura. Pastor, can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Does she have diabetes as well or no? No. Just she's just been through a whole lot physically with her knees. For years. And hips and mm -hmm. For years. She's she had has. several hip surgeries and knee surgeries. Yeah. Yeah. James, yeah. did you get to see her today? I went by her house because she wasn't there, but I got to try to lift, and she just started coming up. But I had such a yeah. good gene that I didn't stop. I had to follow her, but. James was trying to make an effort to contact her today. Um, also, uh, um, there's somebody else that was on my mind just to jump track there. Uh, do y'all have anyone you want to add to our list tonight, a prayer list? Okay, Trey Jordan. Um, he's not doing well at all. Okay, so we need to keep lifting him up, young man. Having a lot of issues. Any other prayer concerns, or praises, or yes, ma'am, Paul. It's okay if we put you on the prayer list. Of course. And um, I've got one praise and one concern. Uh, praise of my nephew, the one with the heart surgery. Um, hopefully, I haven't heard the new, latest news that tomorrow he starts rehab. Mm -hmm. And for a week of rehab, and then um, 
maybe you might be able to get out of the hospital before uh, long and start having a near normal. And then uh, for the concern, I'd like to pray for my wife, Rita, um, for, for Friday. She's going to go see the ear specialist and maybe, maybe, maybe we can find yeah. something that's happening to her. Okay. If not, pray for me because I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. Um, oh, she's not watching Facebook. I know. No, she is watching <laughs> um, And just so you all know, just to uh, update there what George just said, um, he was talking about their nephew, David Harris, who had a heart transplant, and he's doing good, getting ready to get out of the hospital potentially here soon. So that is certainly great. And Ms. Rita has been dealing with seeing her ear it like vertigo, but it's not vertigo. It's well, it's ver she's got vertigo, but she's got an infection in between the ears, too. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know if that's how they put that. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what doctor said, not me. Okay. Said that. I don't think he was smiling when he said it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any others? Uh, let's see. Please pray for my sister, Debbie Clark. Tommy and Debbie are on there. That's my brother-in-law, so that's my older sister. Please she is watching. keep them on prayer. Hey, y'all. Uh, today's Tommy's birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Tommy. Wow. <laughs> um, that's good. Glad you're watching. Uh, any others we need to add to our prayer list? I can offer a praise. Uh, yesterday we closed on the land, so uh, everything went great. We were in the office maybe 20 minutes and everything went fine. So I told Sonia, I said, as soon as I can figure out how, I'm going to get the boat and haul it out there and put it right on the property. And she just looked at me and said, I don't care, that's fine. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was a praise. That's right. She can have her dirt and I can have my boat. So. <laughs> It's David's birthday, not Tommy's. David's, that's right. I thought it was Tommy's, too. It is David McVeigh's birthday, and he just texted me a while ago, and they're having a party for David. David and I have been friends since high school, and um, so he, he texted me a while ago and said he couldn't join us tonight as he normally does. He's in North Carolina, in Kannapolis, uh, so they have a party. So thank you for correcting me. Um, Still no my Yes, oh. that's a praise. Bob Bell is fine. He's doing well. Bob has been AWOL since Thanksgiving. As far as his family were concerned, they could not get a hold of him. Bob Bell has been a wonderful liaison between us and Emmanuel's congregation. He also has started a, a school for the deaf in Honduras years ago, or Guatemala. I get him confused. So that's where he is. He's in Honduras right now. He drives. He drives. All the way to Honduras or Guatemala, he stays for however long. So they haven't heard from him since Thanksgiving. And I talked to Pastor Nestor, and he said, I just talked to him the other week. And matter of fact, somebody I was talking to just saw him, laid their eyes on him this week. So we know he's fine. So I got in touch with his family, and they said, thank you so much. I gave them Pastor Nestor's phone number so they could find him. But we were praying because we didn't know who he was either. But that is Bob. He is the most free spirit you would ever meet. But I promise you, wherever he is, if he's still breathing, he's doing ministry. He is ministering to somebody somehow, some way. He must have a nagging wife, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, James. <laughs> is it a full moon? No. This is how the children act at a full moon. So I, I'm just wondering if that's a full moon. Yara, <laughs> every teacher dreads the full moon because the children get like this. <laughs> um, I did. I, I told you the other day. I met Bob's aunt at uh, First Baptist in Marion uh, a couple years ago, and she said he was that way as a child. She said he would pop in our house with a whole group of guys he just met out on the street somewhere, and said, "Can we stay here for the night?" This is his aunt's house. She said, "Sure." She said, they would crash all over my house at night and morning. They'd be gone. She said, I don't know where they were, where they were going. He's been that way since he was a child, and he has the biggest heart for people and for the Lord. And he is always looking for a way to serve people and minister to people. And 
He's just the coolest fella. So, do you have any idea how old he is? Bob is. Uh, he has to be around eighty, and I'm thinking oh, he's. I'm thinking he's north of that, but oh, just wow. around eighty, and you would never know. But no. when I first found out he's driving, I thought he was flying to Guatemala all this time, <laughs> or to New York. He said he has a school he's worked with up in New York, and he said I'll be gone for a few weeks. I didn't realize he was flying. Every, I mean, driving everywhere. So um, he's just the neatest fellow. But anyway, he's fine. Thank you for asking, Barbara. Any other prayer concerns or praises? I'm going to pray with you. And um, uh, just we have so much to be thankful for, and we're so blessed. Uh, we are, I have some scriptures to share with you tonight. We're, we're talking about the power of the cross tonight and how um, we've been talking about getting to know our culture and how to reach out to our culture. And tonight deals really with the, the text or the meat of what we take to them. And Brother Ben Pierce is going to share with you how a lot of folks come up short. It's not enough to engage the community if you really don't have a message. Engaging the community and giving them some fluffy kind of feel-good message is not what this is about. This is about the gospel. So tonight we're going to talk about the power of the cross. And what that means, and the fact that a lot of churches and a lot of organizations today leave that out because it's not politically correct, it's not received well, it's not all good news. Um, so he's going to talk to us about that, and, and he preaches tonight. He gives us a very definite and direct uh, admonition to get out the gospel, the gospel, which you can't have without the cross. Amen. So anyway, let me, let me pray with you, and then we'll get to that. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you for your goodness and grace and for laughter, Lord. You gave us that, and we thank you that we can enjoy each other as we gather together. Our connection is the Holy Spirit. We have one calling and one mission, but we are all different in our personalities and our journeys. We have history with family and with our jobs and our finances and our health, and together we come together and we, we hold each other up, we admonish one another, we love on each other, and... That's what makes us a family. Lord, I thank you for the fact that when we come together, we can enjoy that and know that we know how the story ends. Father, I pray that you would give us the unction, the motivation to share with others how the story ends and do everything that we can as the Holy Spirit empowers us to get across a very clear and definite message of the gospel, of who Jesus is, that others can enjoy this life and look forward to what's to come. Lord, thank you for answered prayers, and thank you for ministering to these families that we've talked to, that we've talked about, those that have gone through surgeries and, and different things, different valleys. I pray for those who are facing uh, the mountains uh, in front of them. I thank you for Garnett and John and their family. I pray that you'd be with her tomorrow. She faces surgery on her foot. And I pray, Father, you'd be with those, uh, including Garnett and Tony and, and Sue, who have lost uh, loved ones here recently family members. I pray that you be with them in their time of grief and their time of just thinking back and having those memories and the times that they, they've had with family. I pray that you guide us, lead us, teach us to trust you each step of the way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. See if y'all can watch this without falling asleep and <laughs> behave yourself. And I promise you, Brother Ben's about to preach, so you better hold on. <laughs> leaving God behind. How can we show them the love of Jesus in a language they'll understand? We serve an all-powerful God who is ready to break our hearts, fill us with his power, and give us the tools we need to reach the secular world for Jesus. A few years back, I was part of the Christian Battle of Bands, and one of the requirements was that we needed to give a message. And I remember sitting out in the crowd as a band played, and they ended one of the songs, and then their front man started to talk. And he said, you know, we are all about love. We want to love each other, and we want to love you. And that was it. 
they started to play again. And I remember thinking, wow, that was a nice message, but that wasn't really the whole truth. And I remember driving home that night thinking how rare it is for Christian artists and Christians in general to talk about the cross. Uh, a few years later, my band No Longer Music was performing at a festival in New Zealand. Uh, and after we were done playing, we went to go see the headliner play. Uh, this was one of the biggest Christian bands of the time. They performed for two hours and talked about many different things, including overcoming personal struggles, uh, dealing with hardship as a band, but never once did they say Jesus or mention the gospel at all. Why has this become a thing? Why do so few Christians talk about the cross today? I think for many Christians, it's because this message has become old school. It's too hardcore, it's too fundamental. They live in a world that's dominated by secularism and relativism. And in light of that, they shy away from this counter-cultural message. And many Christians even see the gospel as a negative thing today. One time my dad was invited to speak at an event organized by a Christian youth worker. And before he went on to speak, he asked my dad if he was willing to give a positive message, not an evangelistic one. And of course my dad was dumbfounded, but today the gospel has gone out of style. But the Apostle Paul knew that the power was in the message of the cross. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Throughout my time with No Longer Music, I've seen God do incredible things all over the world. And again and again, I've been reminded of the power of the cross. One time we were performing in Croatia. In the day of the show, the weather looked bad. Uh, and to make things worse, we had no covering over the stage. Uh, and as we began to set up, things were getting worse and worse, but the rain held off. So we performed anyway. And then we get all the way to the point of the performance where we start to demonstrate the crucifixion of Jesus and the rain comes down hard. I mean, this was like a monsoon. There was lightning and thunder. I'm looking over at our drummer and our guitarist and we're panicking. We're not sure if we should get our equipment off the stage or what we should do. I'm looking over at our crazy Australian bass player and he doesn't seem to notice at all. I mean, he's just like running on the spot, looking straight out. In fact, I think the weather was just exciting him even more. Uh, and then all of a sudden the power dies. And just like that, in the middle of the crucifixion of Jesus, our show is over. And David, my dad, he jumps off the stage and he goes right into the middle of the mud in the crowd. And he says, I don't care about the show. If you want to know Jesus, you kneel right now and pray with me to receive him. And despite the chaos of our show and not even fully finishing our performance, all of these guys knelt and prayed out loud to receive Jesus. And this was such a vivid reminder that there is power in the message of the cross. And yet so few Christians are sharing it today. And I want to give you five reasons why. The first reason why Christians are not talking about the cross today is because they don't believe it. Now this might seem like a strange accusation. I mean, if they're Christians, of course they believe that Jesus exists. But I'm not talking about the type of belief that's academic or stated or cultural. I'm talking about the kind of belief that's reflected in action. Because ultimately a lot of people say they believe in God, but really they function like atheists. If we believe that to accept or reject what Jesus claimed has eternal consequences, but refuse to ever share, isn't it fair to question that belief? Or at least question the motivation and heart of that person. The second reason why people aren't preaching the gospel is because they prefer other messages. This is the idea that preaching the gospel is a unique calling for certain people in certain contexts. But for me, you know, I talk about other things, social issues or love or life transformation. But sadly, we have been selling people short. Jesus is not just another program for behavioral change. You know, we love to talk about when alcoholics no longer drink or when drug addicts no longer use. And when you come to Jesus, he changes you and that's a good thing. But Jesus is not about taking dirty people and making them clean. He's about taking spiritually dead people and making them alive. And that's what separates Jesus from every other religion, is that it's not about what I do to earn God's love. It's about what he does in me. People don't need another self-help life improvement plan. They need to be forgiven. They need to be reconciled. They need to be connected to their creator. It's not that God doesn't care about social issues and justice. Of course he does. He cares about all of life. Just like I care about all of the needs of my kids, but as a follower of Jesus, my primary concern is that they would know and come to a saving faith in Jesus. 
That is the most important thing. But does that mean I don't feed them when they're hungry? Or clothe them? Or take them to the doctor when they're sick? Of course not. And yet we so often create these false dichotomies that you care about telling people about Jesus and I'll care about feeding people and clothing them when a good father cares about both and as his followers, we should as well. The third reason why people don't want to share the gospel today is because it causes offense. The reality is so many people trade the truth for peace. They simply don't want to go against the grain of culture. The reality is the gospel will offend. It always has. The early church experienced great miracles, but they also experienced riots, and that's simply part of it. And that's because the gospel message runs contrary to everything the world teaches. The world says worship yourself. The cross says deny yourself. The world says it's about pleasure. The cross says it's about suffering. The world says rely on yourself. The cross says you are totally dependent. The world says there are many ways to the truth. The cross says there is only one way. In our culture today, if you're going to preach the gospel, you're going to cause offense. There's simply nothing we can do about it. Of course we should love people. Of course it should be motivated out of concern. But if our number one goal is peace, if our number one goal is fitting in, then we are never going to share the gospel. The fourth reason why people don't want to share the gospel today is because they are not willing to look foolish. It's amazing that no matter how much we grow up, things stay the same. Just like back when we were young, more than anything, we don't want to be made fun of. We don't want to look foolish. But we have to kill our pride and be willing to open up our mouths. Ultimately, self-consciousness is just another form of selfishness. It's saying that I care more about what people think of me than about the truth, than about their well-being. I'd rather not feel uncomfortable. I'd rather not be laughed at than tell a person the most important news they could ever receive. Sadly, one of the greatest barriers to people talking about the cross is a simple unwillingness to be uncool. Finally, people are not talking about the cross today because it's simply hard. They're unwilling to come and pay the cost. I have a friend from Australia who was in our band for a long time, and we experienced some pretty difficult things together. And one of the things that I thought was so great about him is we'd be going through some difficult thing, be super hot or really stressful, and I'd look over at him and he'd have this crazy look in his eyes, and he'd be rubbing his hands together fiercely, and he'd be saying, Embrace it. Want more of it. And he'd be stomping his feet up and down. And of course, this would give me the laugh. But while this was a humorous illustration, for me, this was really important because he modeled something. And that was that sometimes we just have to accept that good things are going to be hard. There's just going to be an element of pushing through and accepting it and realizing that if you want to have a significant life, if you want to make a difference, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a fight. In my time in No Longer Music, I've started riots. We've had our power cut by police. We've been chased by people. We've had things thrown at us. It's not always been easy. But it's also been in those moments that I've seen the power of God move and I've seen lives transformed. If we're going to reach the secular world for Jesus, we need to preach the cross. Because where there is no cross, there is no power. We need to reject the lies and the excuses and the reasons that keep us silent. We need to ask ourselves, do we really believe? Ponder the consequences. Do you really believe that if people don't accept this truth, if they don't turn their lives around, then they aren't going to be spending eternity with God? Do we really believe that? Because if we do, would we not open up our mouths? We need to reject the false dichotomy that some people can share about social issues and other people can share about the gospel, when in truth, the most loving thing you can do is to tell someone about Jesus what he did for them, and how he can set them free. You want to change society? Preach the gospel. We need to be willing to be offensive and even foolish if required, because the message we have to communicate is that important. And ultimately, we need to be able to endure great hardship, because anything of value in this life is going to be hard. Good and hard always go together. And if we always take the path of least resistance, if we always shy away from the difficult thing, we will not have the impact that God desires for us to have.
got it. Um, I have several verses tonight that I want you to help me with if you're willing to read a scripture. Uh, could you let me know? Uh, the first one is 2 Corinthians 1, 18. I don't want you to read it right now. I just want you to look it up. 2 Corinthians. Uh, hold on just a second. I'll, I can't read my own right if that's 1 Corinthians or 2nd. Uh, let me check before you have me right. read something here. That's all right. You can laugh. We're laughing with it. We're not laughing with it. Yes, they do a little of both, so it's, it's fine. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Yes, it is 1 Corinthians. See, I just went over it too many times, and there's two lines instead of one. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Who wants to read that? Thank you, Marsha. Okay, Galatians 6.14. Who's got that one? Galatians 6.14. I got it. Thank you, Roberta. Philippians 2.8. Philippians 2 8. How about 1 Peter 2 24? Philippians 2 8. You, you got that one, Ken? You got the Philippians one? Okay, that's Ken. Barbara, you, will you take uh, 1 Peter 2 24? 1 Peter 2.24. And the other two are in Colossians. 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 Marsha, will you take Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20? Mm -hmm. And then the, the last one is Colossians chapter 2, okay. verses 13 through 14. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. That's Colossians 2, 13 through 14. Okay. Before we... Um, before Y'all read those. Um, I'm talking about the cross. I told you he was going to preach. And I wanted you to know this just off, um, just an aside here. I can't tell you how difficult it is to find someone that is giving video presentations or speaking or doing evangelistic work or whatever that is that passionate about this book and about the gospel. They are. There are so many people out there that have abandoned the truth of the gospel and just like years and years ago at one of our music conferences, they had mentioned the tendency that a lot of people had in writing songs to take out the cross and, su and substitute the word love because the cross was offensive. So, and that was years and years ago. And there are a lot of song books in churches today, church services, uh, there are a lot of songs on the radio that you will never, ever hear the word cross or blood. That's, that was the, the one thing that was, that was tied there together. Is everywhere there was blood mentioned, it was replaced with love. So I appreciate Brother Ben being very accurate and straightforward with how important it is to speak the gospel as it is in God's word, which is centered around the cross and namely the person of Jesus. So uh, it's so important. So first of all, let's take a look here at 1 Corinthians 1.18. Marcia, 1 Corinthians 1.18. I know very well how foolish it sounds to those who are lost when they hear that Jesus died to save them. But we who are saved recognize this message as the very power of God. Yes. And we talked about this Sunday, the verse there in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. The power of the gospel and the cross is right there in the middle of it. The power of the gospel cannot be present if the, if the cross is left out. Galatians 6.14, Roberta. Yeah, can I read 13 first? Because my, in my translation, it's on 14, it says, I hope I will never boast about things like that. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. 13, 14. 13 says, they are circumcised, but they don't obey the law themselves. They want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about what they did to you. Then in 14, it says, I hope I will never boast about things like that. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is my only reason for boasting. Through Jesus' death on the cross, the world is dead to me, and I am dead to the world. That's right. 
I heard someone say one time about the crosses, about Christians wearing crosses around their neck. They said, you know that's a symbol for, um, for death, and, and, it, and it signifies something very ugly. So why would you even want to wear something like that? Well, that's why. Because Paul is writing there, and he says, listen, he's speaking mainly to the Jewish folks right there because they're bragging about the circumcision and about their traditions and their laws and so forth. And he said, if I'm going to brag at all, it's going to be about the cross, about what Jesus did on the cross for me and for you. So it is very important that we not just remember the cross, but we understand without it there is no gospel. And the cross is empty. He rose again. That's right. That's right. There has to be death before there can be life. Jesus gave us a perfect example. Thank you, Bert. Philippians 2.8, Brother Ken. Philippians 2.8. Yes, and being found in the appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's right. Jesus gave that example of being obedient to the Father, even to the point of dying on a cruel cross. And that tells us how important it is for us to die to self. And Brother Pierce, uh, Ben Pierce mentioned that. He said, for the world, it's about this life and it's about the pleasures of this life. For the gospel, it's about dying to self. And that's why it's so important not to take the cross away, but to leave it in there. And, and that's what this passage is, is talking about. Obedience to the Father, even to the point of, of death. The Bible says unless we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, we're not fit for the kingdom. 1 Peter 2.24, Miss Barbara. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That's right. I love that passage because Jesus took on the cross to give us spiritual healing. And, and what she just read was very, um, very specific about the spiritual healing. That's why he went to the cross. If you remove the cross, you also remove your spiritual healing. You're back in bonds again, in chains, and shackles. And that's why we cannot leave it out. The cross is that important. Uh, Colossians 2, 13 and 14. Uh, Chandra? It's, um, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Jesus did that. And it says we were dead in and of ourselves, in our own sin, in our shackles. And he's talking there, Paul, the church in Colossae, and he says, listen, y'all were, were, you had nothing to offer God. You can try to keep these laws and these traditions and these things, but you had nothing to offer you dead. And as you were in that state, Jesus went to the cross and took that, took it on himself so that you could have life. When Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men, it's that daily dying. It's that remembering that we submit ourselves to who he is, his authority, and the work of the cross every day. And that's how we have this life, this abundant life, now and eternally, forevermore. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. Marcia. For God wanted all himself to be in his son. It was through what his son did that God cleared the path for everything to come to him, all things in heaven and on earth. For Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. Yes. Christ died on the cross. That satisfied, we talked about this past Sunday, that satisfied the debt. It satisfied what the Father required. That's what propitiation means. He satisfied that debt. Without the cross, you and I still owe God. We owe Him, and there's a debt that we cannot pay. It, it's, it's, we can't do it. But because Jesus was willing to go to the cross, lay down His life, to please the Father and out of love for you and me, that debt has been paid. You see, the cross is the central part of this gospel. And Jesus on that cross is that, that key to this gospel. So the reminder tonight is the power in the cross, and the gospel is not the gospel without the cross. And there's so many people, 
I can name them and you would know them because you can see them on TV or listen to them on the radio. They never, ever, ever mention the cross or sin or asking for forgiveness or repentance. They always talk about love. And it is some generic, warm, fuzzy kind of worldly love. It is never about dying to self. It is never about being nailed to the cross when Jesus went and took our place because that is not politically correct. It's not received well. It's offensive. We just don't talk about that. But folks, if you want the power of the cross, remember the Bible says in later times, people will adhere to a form of godliness but deny its power. And we just talked about this in Romans 1.16. It's the power of God for salvation. It's the cross. It's Jesus on the cross. People will deny the power. They want a form of godliness. They want to go through the ritual, go through the... They want to feel good about themselves. If we could promise that every time this people came into this room, they would leave here feeling better about themselves than they came in, it wouldn't take long. The word would get out, and then we could have a good crowd, and we'd have a good time but we would be doing them a disservice because we would be lying about what the gospel actually is. Amen. The gospel is to give us life, an abundant life, an eternal life. But Ben actually went as far as to say for this world, it's about pleasure. The gospel is about suffering. Remember he said that? Jesus talked about it. He preached it. Peter preached it. Paul preached it. James talked about it. It's about the suffering as a believer, it's about, well, I'm scared I'm going to lose my job. Well, when's the last time you, you said enough about the gospel to even, to even worry about losing your job? Amen. When's the last time you said enough to your neighbor to even offend them because it was about the gospel, about Jesus? We had a meeting uh, years and years ago. And we were talking about evangelism and going out, just sharing the gospel from this building. And one person said, well, we don't want to go to them and talk about sin because that's offensive. Folks, there is no gospel without sin, without talking about sin, without dealing with sin. Because you don't need grace if you're not a sinner. You and I don't need forgiveness. We don't need mercy or grace. We don't need a Savior if we're not sinners by our nature. And the Bible says very clearly, no one is righteous. No, not one. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. So the cross is that important. So so as I close tonight, I want you to, to just think about this and mill over this in your minds that it is not enough to engage the culture. That is not, Ben is not telling us this. We're not going through these Bible studies just so we can gain entrance to a conversation with our culture. We fall short if that's what we see here. We are doing this, trying to get to know our culture, trying to find a way to engage in a conversation with them, trying to get to know who they are, why they believe what they believe, uh, how they think uh, about the origin of life. We talked about this last week. I think it was part of your homework to interview someone that was a Christian or a non-Christian. Ask them, where do you think life came from? What happens after we die? Those kind of questions that we actually saw in the video last week. Did anybody get to do any of that or interview? Where did you find out? I have two. Okay, awesome. cool. First one, I'm going to do the second one first. Okay. Out of the universe, our world and human beings come into existence. This person said created by God. Created by God. What's the meaning of life? Knowing and following God and his purpose for me. Number three, is there such a thing as right and wrong and who decides? Yes, God. What happens when we die? Is there an afterlife? We will... Uh, Ascend into heaven to live eternally. That was the first one. Okay. The second one. How did the universe, our world, and human beings come into existence? Evolution, the Big Bang. Okay. What's the meaning of life? Try to leave this earth better than I found it. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as right and wrong, and who decides? Yes, each individual. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. What happens when we die? Is there an afterlife? I hope so. I'm guessing the second one was not a professing believer. But um, those were complete opposite answers. There was a problem with the first one, though, in the last answer. Did you catch that? The last answer to that question, what happens after this life? Or where do we go? Ascended to heaven to be, live eternal. Yes. Or? Oh, yeah. There's an or. Yeah. Hell is just as real as heaven. And, and so the first one was right on target. 
And that last question, though, maybe they were answering just out of their, their that's where they're going. Yeah. And that would be great, but um, there's an option there. The second one was interesting, but it was it was it was exactly what our world that we live in believes. That's that's where they're coming from. It's great. Did you have any trouble engaging those conversations, or did they open up? The second one, I was a little worried about asking the questions, but it was okay. Anybody else? We apply what we talked about tonight to what we just heard here and talked about that without the cross, without Jesus, there is no hope. You know, and they were right in their estimation there that I hope there's something better coming because, and that kind of hope is not biblical kind of hope. That's just, I, I wish, or I, I'm, you know, I'm holding on drawn straws here. I, I, you know, maybe something good is coming. The hope that we do have from Scripture at all hinges on Jesus and the cross, and we have true hope. In him. But there is no there is no hope, there is no peace, there is no uh, bright light at the end of the tunnel for those that are only thinking, well, maybe I'll leave this planet better than I found it and I'll be moral to people and treat them pretty decent and then, and, you know, hopefully I'll get to go to heaven. You and I should know by now the Bible is very clear that without the cross and putting our faith in Jesus, hell is the destination for that person. It is the destination for every single person unless we make a conscious choice to put our faith in Jesus. It is the built-in, it is the default destination for every person mm -hmm. unless we make a conscious decision to place our faith in Jesus. And the cross is real. It is real. People want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to do what they want to do. They just want to go yes. when it's over to the hell. Yes. Now, if y'all remember during the uh, that football game where that football player had that heart attack. Yeah. And um, you know, he was in, in bad shape. And they uh, said to pray. And then I heard somebody say, there was more people praying that didn't even know how to pray, but they're praying for this football player, you know, which is great. But I mean, they really had no idea, right. but they're just, you know, they cared for the person. Right. You know, to pray, but you know, they said they're amazed at how many people are coming up. And, you know, groups are getting together, and a lot of them did not believe in Jesus or believe in God, right. but mm -hmm. they're going to pray. Right. It's life and death. It's just like that. If you if you remember the movie Case for Christ with Lee Struggle, and as it's a true story, and you remember Lee Struggle was an editor for the Chicago Tribune, and he was an atheist, a devout atheist, until his wife became a believer, and he told her, I didn't sign up to share you with anybody, so we, you either with me or you against me, that's how he saw it, so he set out to dismiss and to disprove Christianity, and the more that he endeavored to disprove Christianity, the more evidence he uncovered that it was actually true, and he came to that point of saying, it takes more faith. To believe this kind of stuff than it does to believe what the Bible says. And he made a point of, of talking about sometimes atheists or agnostics. Really, this is something that they make themselves say. Because everything around us, the Bible tells us that in Romans 1, reveals that there is a God. We read so much about it, nothing in the Bible has ever had to be recanted or rewritten. It's, it is what it is. It's true. It's always been true. And he said a lot of times an atheist is an atheist until hard times come their way. Mm -hmm. If you remember when 9-11 happened, there were prayers happening in, in mayor's offices, in the White House, all over the place, on the streets. They were having press conferences and they would have prayer. And it was the thing to do because down deep inside, as Paul writes here in Rome and the Romans, as he was inspired, there is something down deep inside that tells us there is a God. And he said, no one has an excuse. 
God has revealed that in our very being and in the nature around us so people know. But, um, yes, people are looking for some kind of hope and unfortunately they're grasping, grasping at straws and just saying, you know, maybe, just maybe, what comes next is better. That's a bad way to live life. It's, it's a very hopeless way to live life. Um, so we can't leave the cross out. Uh, the Christianity is nothing without the cross. It's, it's just another social group. With the cross, there's power. There's power for transformation and for eternal life. Any questions or comments about this tonight? I'll leave you with this, and I'll actually let you get out a couple minutes early. Well, maybe. <laughs> Not because you've been good, but... <laughs> I had a professor that, that told this true story, and it changed the way I think about witnessing. And that's one of the things we're supposed to do this coming week as our homework, is to um, share the gospel. Share the gospel. And always, well, most of the time, we're a little fearful of sharing the gospel because we're afraid of, just like he said, we're afraid of being rejected, we're afraid of looking foolish, we're afraid of how what it will cost us. He named all those reasons why um, we don't talk about the cross. One of my professors said one day he was in a car and he was in there with a friend and they were trying to witness to somebody and he had this mindset that I've got to convince this guy of what this Bible says and of this gospel and it's, there's just a lot going on and he said the Holy Spirit had talked to me before and the details of this was the man was demon possessed and he gave a lot of details about what had happened before this. So he, he shared the scripture with the man. He said the Holy Spirit had given him very clearly a, a reminder that it was the Holy Spirit who did the transforming. Mm -hmm. It was the Holy Spirit who did the convicting. It was the Holy Spirit who was going to convince this man, convict this man, and transform this man. It was not up to the professor. He was just a messenger. So he said it took a load off of him like he had never felt before. And he said I shared the scripture with him and asked him to read it out loud. He read it. He said, okay, read it again. And he read it again. And he said, read it again. And he said, he kept asking him to read this scripture. It's one of the ones that talks about the cross. And he kept on until it, the Holy Spirit moved in his life. And he freed him. And he saw the Holy Spirit do a work in this man's life. And he said, the point was that I had to trust in the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit alone can do. Mm -hmm wasn't on me. I wasn't trying to convince this man, convict this man. I wasn't trying to cast out a demon in my own strength. All I was doing was sharing the gospel and letting the word of God and the power therein do what it and it alone can do. And it, when we're sharing the gospel with people, if we remember that we are just the messengers, that is our job to deliver a true and accurate message. And if you have a testament with you or your Bible or a book that you use. There's one in my car that I bought specifically for this, and it's marked. And it's very easy to just turn it, uh, open it up to the, the scripture that we're starting with, uh, Romans 6, 23, 3, 23, and go down through some of these Roman road passages and ask them, do you read it? I don't have to read it. Do you read it? All we literally have to do is turn the page. Read this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Read this one. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Read this one. Revelation 3.20. I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears my voice opens the door. I'll come in to him and sup with him and eat with me. It's the Roman road. But you let them read it. You let the power of God's word do what it and it alone can do. You don't have to convince. And you can't. If you guilt somebody into believing something, somebody else can guilt them into not believing. It's up to the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's my stuff for tonight. I'm going to pray with you. Yes, ma'am. You have a question or comment? Yes, thank you. are going to get out of here. Um. Uh, <laughs> um, you know that I've been talking to my sister. Yes. And, and you told me that. that it's, you know, it's not up to me to convince her. It's, and, sure. you know, so I, I keep that in mind. But she asked me recently, why, why did I keep bringing this up? And I said, I don't want you to go to hell. And it was crickets. Oh my. I don't think she, you know, she thought I wanted her to, you know, share my opinion. You know, I wanted her to be like me. I wanted her 
That is the only reason that I keep capturing her. And, and no doubt that it had to come across in some way of letting her know you care about her. I mean, you, you care about her. So you took you out of the, the element, out of the mix. And good for you. Good for you. We'll be praying about that. That's the key right there. Plant the seeds. The Holy Spirit will do the work. All right. I'll leave you alone. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your word and your spirit. Father, I pray that you would draw us to your word and change us, transform us. By the renewing of our minds, Lord, make us to be new people. And I pray that you would open our mouths to share the gospel with those around us, understand that they need the gospel. They need Jesus. They don't need a watered-down version. They don't need a politically correct version. They need the gospel. The clear message of Jesus Christ. Help us to be a good steward of the message we've been given. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Remember Saturday, if you can be here at 9 o'clock, we're going to set this room up. Sunday.